Hello and welcome to The Pursuit Zone. I am your host, Paul Schmid, and I interview explorers from around the globe to bring you their exciting stories. These are people that dream big, break out of their comfort zones, and take on ambitious pursuits. This is episode 172 with Tim Milliken, where he shares stories about his three-year cycling adventure. So let's get into the show, and let me introduce Tim. From his home in Reading, England, to the finish line in Reading, Pennsylvania, it was a journey of 46,500 kilometers spanning over three years. On a bicycle he built for less than 500 pounds, he cycled through 39 countries, experiencing the stunning vistas of Kyrgyzstan and the soul-crushing roads of the Atacama Desert. In El Salvador, he was hit by a car and hospitalized, but continued on with a new bike. As part of the adventure, he is raising funds for the Royal Burks Charity and SOS Children's Villages. And you can learn more at his website, readingtoreading.com. Tim Milliken, welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Paul, cool. thank you very much for having me. Tim, I guess the first question I would have is uh, your hometown of Reading, England. How would you describe that? I would describe it as home. Uh, it's a beautiful place in my view. People wouldn't say that. It's quite a suburban place in England. So it's not like a big city like London or Manchester. It lies just 30 miles to the west of London. So it's more of a commuter town, but it's, it's, going, it's got its own soul, I like to think. Um, the River Thames runs through it, which is quite pretty, especially in the summer. So it's got quite a lot of countryside surrounding Reading itself. But Reading, the heart of Reading, is quite a suburban sort of commutery type town. Before you started the cycling trip, what were you mm -hmm. doing? Um, so what I did for a job before that, I was a travel agent. So I was actually selling people's trips and holidays. So it's a really good platform to kind of get inspired in adventure and kind of like you spend a whole time looking at maps and planning other people's trips and it really makes you want to do your own work. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you do that? I did that for two years. Um, so I used to live in Australia before that. And when I came back from Australia, um, I wanted a change of career and I kind of had a travel mindset. So I went into selling travel as for two years and then I still couldn't still wanted to continue my travel adventure. So that's when I left for the bike trip after that. Part of why you wanted to do this trip was because you got inspired by this job working in the travel industry. But was there any mm -hmm. other reason why you would want to take on a, a big a cycling trip like this? Yeah, there was a big reason. So as I said before, I used to live in Australia. So I moved to Australia in like 2009 to get away from London and get away from my career there. So I moved there on a working holiday visa and I was traveling up the East Coast. So I was on a bus from Brisbane to a place called 1770 up on the northeast coast of Australia. And I was looking out the window and just thinking like, oh man, like I'm missing all of this. Like I'm missing all these little villages and all these little places. Like I wonder if I could see that on a bicycle. And I wrote in my little notebook I had at the time and said, hey, Maybe I could travel Australia by bicycle and then cross it out and said, maybe I could cycle home from Australia. Maybe like a rebirth. It would take like nine months. It would change my life. It would kind of set the seed for traveling by bicycle and being in a more immersive trip. What I then did, I then told my girlfriend at the time who was uh, dead against it. <laughs> she said, you're crazy. And we flew home from Australia. But that idea stuck in my head. And along with selling travel as a travel agent, that kind of germinated into the big plan, which became the round the world trip. Now, how did you go about learning what to do? Were there any websites or people that uh, inspired you? Yes. My biggest inspiration was a guy called Alistair Humphreys. I'm sure you've all heard of. He's a British adventurer, really, really famous. Um, and he wrote two books about cycle touring from his round the world trip. And that is still, to my, my mind, the best cycle travel books I've ever read. And I've read a lot of them. So he speaks really from the heart, really honestly, and he really describes what it's like to actually cycle around the world on a very little money as well. That's important. And I got a lot of inspiration from him, from his ideas. And then practically, I would look at websites like Tom's Bike Trip or um, guides on bicycle travel, like the CTC, which is a British touring bike company, and get a lot of the actual practical stuff from those sites. But the actual inspiration comes from Alistair Humphreys, I would say. He's a real inspiration to me. Tim, before you started, uh, did you have any fears? One of the biggest fears I had was was kind of like, I didn't fear any sort of climate or I didn't fear any country or person. I kind of, my biggest fear was just failure. It was a little bit of time when I was cycling through Romania. And I remember 
there were these birds in Romania that when they squawked, it sounded like they were laughing at you. And I remember listening to this and it felt like the whole world was laughing at me. Like how audacious was this plan? How, why would I be someone who could cycle around the world just as geezer from Reading? But once you start and once you carry on, you sometimes feel that you've got so far, like, oh, these birds were laughing at me. But I was like, no, I've cycled from England to Romania. That's a big step. And then I knew from that point onwards, I'd be able to carry on. But I guess that was my biggest fear was, was stopping and kind of like failure from the beginning. So I put a lot of thought, time, effort, planning into this. It was my biggest endeavor of all time. So I didn't want to let anyone down, including myself mainly. How much planning would you estimate it was? I'd say planning for a year, definitely a good year, but planning small time. So not like dedicating a full year. I had a job, but I would have a big map on the wall that I would trace a route out on. I would be constantly researching at work what I needed to get and buy. Um, I also did a two-week trial rides in Europe so from Munich to Vienna with Fanola who started the trip with me and that we did a two-week trip just to see if we actually like cycle touring because the worst thing is if we start this whole trip and everyone we don't like it then it's a pretty waste of time so I really recommend to anyone to actually go on a small trip just to check that you like it before you actually endeavor to spend the next three years of your life cycling. Um, what kind of adjustments did you make after that small trip? Well that was more of a holiday trip so that was wild camping but a lot of a lot more money was spent on budget. So then we had a lot of sausages, a lot of beer, a lot of sightseeing. From that, we knew that we enjoyed the ride, like to ride every day for 10 days was fun. And then the adjustments would come by actually just lowering the budget because that was quite an expensive two weeks. And to go across the world, you need to actually rein in the spending. Otherwise, you're going to run out of money pretty quickly. Uh, you did a pretty good job because I saw on your website, your budget for the whole trip was about $12,000. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, for three years. Yeah, I was super cheap. <laughs> uh, hey, Tim, let's talk about your bike because you didn't just go out and buy one. You built this thing yourself. Tell me about that process. Okay, so the bike I built was a bike that I called Bikey One. It was a bike that I wanted to buy, but I couldn't afford to buy a bike off the peg. So an off the peg touring bike in England, it's about £2,000. So that's probably $2,500 just for the bicycle, for like fully spec, for like the best one you can get. So I didn't want to commit that much money to my trip in terms of just setting off because then I have less money to spend when I was going. So I actually decided to build it myself. So I bought the steel frame, just the frame and the forks off a of second hand off eBay, and that was £90 for the frame. And then I took all the bits from my old mountain bike, like the, the gears and the derailleurs and the handlebar, and then put all that onto this frame. And with that, I was then able to have a good, solid working bike. And now the bike itself must have cost me 150 to 200 pounds. I then added uh, a dynamo off eBay. All the panniers were off eBay. The racks were off eBay. The lights were off eBay. Um, so I had then a fully spec touring bike. So it was ready to go. Like it was had a dynamo. It could charge my phone. It had all the bags. Everything worked. And that whole thing cost me less than 500 pounds. So it's like super super cheap and i had everything on it it was um a really good money saver and for nola's bike and when we got her bike we found that on ebay fully spec shimano xt females aluminium bike 140 quid bought it job done so we both spent very little money on the bikes nice hey uh, what did yeah. you what did you do for wheels and tires on your bike so i had suave marathon tires the classic touring tires that everybody uses and 26 inch wheels with, um, I can't remember what brand they were. I think one front wheel was like a Shimano with a, a Dyna hub on the hub. And the back wheel could have been anything I just bought offline. So I don't remember what that was. But they were 26 inch wheels and two inch marathon swabby tires, which were awesome. Kevlar reinforced. I really recommend them to anyone traveling by bike. How many pairs of tires did you end up going through? Four loads. Right. It was 30,000 miles. So. I don't know. It's, like, it's funny because I don't remember how many tires it was exactly, but there was times when like you would replace one set and they would last, say, 10,000 kilometers or 6,000 miles. But there's another time when you just say you're in somewhere like Kyrgyzstan or Uzbekistan when you're trying to pick up replacement parts. You just can't get the good quality ones you'd find in America or Europe. So you, you have to buy cheaper ones and they could last 1,000, 2,000 miles. So a fair few, I think, is a fair analogy and a lot more punches than that, to be fair. <laughs> mechanically how did the bike hold up over the whole trip uh it was an absolute dream so because i built it myself it was built very simply because I'm, I'm i can do some bike mechanics but i can only do things that i can do which is the easy things so it had cable brakes and it had um, a simple shimano derailleur so 
in terms of mechanically, I had very little problems with it. The frame, the steel frame, lasted really well. Even in Laos, I was cycling in Laos and I was going past this really cute little village and I literally just passed the village and I heard a snap on the back side of the bike. So I pulled over to see what the problem was and I saw that my chain stay on the right hand side, this, the bit that brings the main triangle up to the second triangle, it snapped close to the derailleur. And I was like, oh man, this is the worst, like we're going to get fixed in the middle of Laos, I need to find a welder. But luckily there was actually a welder in the, in the tiny little village that we'd just gone past because... In Laos and in Southeast Asia, especially, everyone has a welder in their village because everyone, everything is always breaking and then it has to be refixed. So I got it fixed by a 14-year-old boy um, who operated the welding machine, and he asked him how much he wanted to, for the for his job, for his hours labour. He asked for one dollar, so I gave him three dollars, and he was over the moon, and I was really happy, and we had to carry on. Um, so the bike handed out really well, and because I picked the material of being steel and built it myself, it lasted longer than I think than a off the peg bike would. At least I knew how to fix it anyway. How did you learn how to build a bike? Mm, good question. So I didn't. At the beginning, I had no real knowledge other than to change an inner tube. So I joined up with a project called the Reading Bicycle Kitchen. Now, they're like a bike kitchen or a bike cart. I don't know if you have them over where you are. I think you have them in New York or maybe around San Francisco maybe. So it's basically like a community hub where people can come in and they can learn how to fix bikes and use tools and use the workshop and fix their own bikes. So by volunteering there, I would only I would get trained and then also have free reign just to work on bikes, just to try and rebuild donated bikes that come in and then we would sell them to raise money for the community space. So I had a year, I did that for a year before I left and that year of experience with them set me up in such good stead because I was just, I could understand how the bike worked and I understand like how things got together. So if I had to bodge something, I knew how it works. And therefore, I was less reliant on expensive bike shops and expensive parts. I knew I could make it myself on the road as well. So I really recommend anyone who is looking to go on a big bike tour just to learn some mechanics. And if there's a bike cart near you, it's a really cheap and interesting way to learn bike mechanics and while helping the community at the same time. Were you running both front and rear panniers? Yes. Yeah. I had two on the front, two panniers on the back, and then a bag on top of the two, and then a tent on top of that. So maybe five or six bags in total. Do you know what your weight was? The weight without any food or water. So when I flew from Singapore to Australia, it came in at 46 kilos. But when I was cycling in Australia with food and water, it weighed 75 kilos. (laughs) So um, big difference. How did you come up with the route? What I wanted to do was kind of cycle around the world. And for some reason, I really wanted to go from Red in England to Red in USA. It's kind of, it just felt like a really nice bookend, a really nice title. Red in Pennsylvania was only 100 miles from New York. So it was kind of like the finish line. It was Reading to Reading. And then I had this big wall on my, on my big map, sorry, on my wall of my house. And I would just literally had a pen and just sketched out a route of all the countries that I wanted to go through. So it started going east across Europe, down through Croatia, across into Romania, Turkey, across the stands and China. So just by having that, I would then be able to have a visual representation of the route. But it wasn't, that wasn't the route we actually took. It was very close to it. But there were times when, like when we were going through Europe, we were in Germany and we we're going like, oh man, like Germany's expensive. I think Croatia is going to be expensive. Let's change that and let's go to the Czech Republic, which is going to be a cheaper country. So whilst we kept going east, we could tweak it and change it on kind of like a macro scale as we were going, which really did help and made it all creative and flexible. But the main route was essentially sketched out on a giant wall map on the side of the bedroom. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, the route and some of the countries mm-hmm. that you went through. And I'll just say that I pulled this off your website before we mm-hmm. get going here. Is you listed your top three countries as Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, and Bolivia. And yeah. your, the, your, I think your least favorite countries as Uzbekistan, Hungary, and Nicaragua. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> so, it's a full mix, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, the the route, uh, I guess well, we can go one by one, maybe talk a little bit about what you remember, what things stand out. Um, but the first one was from your home in Reading to uh, Baku. Well, Baku, where, tell me, remind me what country that's in. That's in Azerbaijan. So if you have, so as you go past Europe, you get into Turkey and you cross Turkey and then you've got Georgia to the east of that. And then Azerbaijan is the east of that. And Baku is the capital and it's found on the coast of the Caspian Sea. How was that section? 
that was really good because that was the first section of the whole trip, so to speak. And it was a real big shift in ability and attitude and learning curve, especially Europe. Like when we first left, we battled three days of headwind in England. We arrived into France and we were putting up our tent for the first ever time. We'd never even put the tent up before. So we didn't even know how to put the fly sheet up. So we that night we were like, oh man, this is nuts. Like this fly sheet doesn't even go up. I got my head torched and swung it around and I just couldn't get it to work. I was getting really frustrated. And then all the rain was coming in. So we actually just sort of put the, the fly sheet over the top, but it kind of blew off. It was a nightmare. So we were very, very young and green at that first stage. And as we went forward, we got better and better and better and better. And by the time we got to Czech Republic, we'd become quite established cycle tourists. Could we cycle through uh, Belgium and France and Holland and Germany at that point? So we actually got a bit of a routine and got our bits together in terms of our knowledge and our skills by the time we'd reached Czech Republic. Another thing we found during that section was that we would actually learning a lot more of how to be better cycle tourists, like to say yes to things. Because at the, at the beginning, we were still quite closed Europeans. So when people says, hey, do you want to stay at your house? We go, oh, no, no, no. We don't want to put you out. We're British. We've got this stiff upper lip. No, thank you. But by the time we'd crossed Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe, especially where the people are so friendly and super giving, we were then having a much more fun time because we were able to stay with people we were able to share meals share drinks share parties it was just a real immersive experience and that was learned again in crossing from western europe into eastern europe it was kind of like our mindset shifted from western european mindset a bit more to a eastern european mindset which is really cool <clears throat> pardon me let's look through my questions many um are in fact probably all of the cycle tourists that i've ever spoken to Mm -hmm. uh, they they love Georgia. They have nothing yeah. ever bad to say about Georgia. How was your experience in Georgia? I love Georgia. I, as I said, it's like Tom, one of my top three countries. It is so much fun and it's so beautiful. I used to call it the naughty boy, right? Because you've got Turkey, Azerbaijan, Iran, all around it. And they're all Muslim countries, so they don't drink. But when you get into Georgia, like, this is the home of wine. Everyone has like 100 liters of red wine in their garden. So like it's just a fun party the georgians are more like russian they're quite lives they're like wrestlers they love drinking and telling stories and you've got this backdrop to these beautiful caucus mountains which um line line the view and they're just it's absolutely stunning cycling it's super cheap i remember going to a restaurant in tbilisi in the capital for dinner with fanola and we sat down and we were having this meal and we were like oh we'll order a bottle of wine like we were you know treating ourselves to a nice meal in a restaurant the, the wine came out and it was a bottle of fresh white georgian wine and it was 75p and it was like oh this is amazing because it's lived here forever georgia is super fun and i would recommend anyone to go to georgia on their holidays on their on their bike trips it's a super country why did you list hungary as being on your least favorite because it's super flat so it's quite actually it's a bit compare it to a bit like kansas in your in america like it's flat and there's a lot of farmland it was very hot it was about 40 degrees at the time so it was difficult. There wasn't much interest in camping spots. Um, so it was more of a case of just getting through Hungary. So from Czech Republic and Slovakia, which were really fun, Hungary kind of just felt like a going through country. And then we got to Romania, which again was super fun, super mountainous, super friendly. So that's why I really didn't enjoy Hungary. Just the hot and the flatness of it. It was actually quite a boring place to go for me. So is everything before Hungary fairly flat? Yeah, like Czech Republic is where we started to get some decent hills, but Western Europe is pretty flat in general, other than if you go into the Alps and the, the Dolomites and things. But if you stay north of that, as we did, so we went through Germany, through Frankfurt, through Czech Republic, where the hills start to come, and then Hungary is quite flat until you get to the um, the mountains in Romania, which is where the mountains first started for us. Are you riding on like tarmac bike paths or on roads or on little dirt country roads or, or kind of a combination? What, what, uh, how did that work for you? All three. So at the beginning we only cycled on roads cause we didn't know there were bike routes. And then we got to Belgium and these guys are like, Tim, like there's bike routes. Like you can just follow these maps and you've got all this access to these beautiful paved bike routes across Belgium, across uh, Holland and across Germany. Then when we're back into sort of Czech Republic, Slovakia, it's more roads, but with some off-roading. 
And then in Romania and Turkey, it's a lot more off-roading. So it's a lot more uh, wild and forest tracks and things like that, which is super fun. And the bikes were made to go on any kind of road. So that was that was the beauty of building it itself. It was able to do anything, really. What was it like in Baku? Baku was cool, man. Like We stayed there for a while because we had to get a boat from Baku um, across to Kazakhstan. So we stayed there for maybe six days because the only way to get a boat is you call up a number and they go... You go, hey, is the boat here yet? And they go, no, it's not here today. So there's no timetable. So you, the minute you call up one day and they go, Can I, is the boat here? And they go, yes, you've got two hours to get here and it's 75 kilometers away. So it's, it's quite a stressful situation to be in Baku. But we found the generous hospitality of these, these guys called the Green Bicycle Club or like the, the Green Bicycle Club. And they're kind of a little group of people, Azerbaijan people who live in Baku and they helped us tremendously with the boat, with uh, translations. Uh, they let us stay in their office. We went for dinner with them. It became like a real friendship group, even though they were there for six or seven days. So I enjoyed Baku. It's a big city. Like, don't get me wrong. It's lots of industry, lots of money there. It's on the banks of the Caspian Sea. But because we had the hospitality of the Green Bicycle Club, we actually had a really good time. Okay, now let's talk about the second section, Baku to mm-hmm. Singapore. Yeah. What do you remember about that? this section? This section had the absolute highs for me scenically of the whole trip you know central asia itself was mind-blowingly fantastic kazakhstan like deserts super desert camels walking around people like drinking fermented yak's milk it was super fun you then got the architecture of uzbekistan you've got the mountains of kyrgyzstan which are just is the road from bishkek to osh in kyrgyzstan is still to this day the most beautiful road i've ever ridden it's fantastic and that whole section of visas complications money uh, lots of alcohol lots of things to see tough times scorpions camels it made it really really interesting and fun just because it's all mind-blowingly new like every day just brought a new challenge and new experience which was great then china once we got into china we decided to cycle from um, the border of kyrgyzstan across the taklaman desert which is like the, one of the most driest and boring deserts in the world because there's just a big highway and you, it's, the desert's actually fenced off. So you kind of just spend two weeks just cycling along like a motorway. And it's really, really quite boring. And we're eating petrol noodles every day for, for food. So that wasn't so good. But then we got into the south of China, which was, again, mountainous and more rural and then more fun before we hit Southeast Asia, which was easy, super easy. Like, don't get me wrong, it's cheap, it's fun, it's lots of places to stay. But it's just for the cycle tourists, for me, I get a lot more satisfaction out of the tougher areas where Southeast Asia was actually quite simple. It was quite lots of alcohol, lots of nice places to stay, lots of Western people to talk to. Just very easy compared to Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, China, which was a lot more tougher and rural and for me, a better experience. Well, let's go back and talk about Kyrgyzstan a bit. Um, you mentioned mm-hmm. that uh, that's one of the, the best roads that you cycled on. Tell me more about that. Okay, yes. Yeah, so Kyrgyzstan is... They have mountains in Kyrgyzstan, um, which are some of the highest I've ever seen. 7,000 meter peaks looking down at you as you cycle in the valleys. Um, we were there in the end of September, beginning of October. So it was super cold. It was like minus 15 on the top of the passes. Like snow and ice was kind of hanging off my beard as I crossed the, the Talbek, I think it is, Talbek Pass, which is 4,600 meters in elevation. It was stunningly beautiful, rugged tough but like you would just stay in these really awesome little guest houses because it was so cold everybody would take you in i remember one guy took us in and he only had one tea bag and we all shared one tea bag between me Fernando, and him and we drank tea and warmed us up by the fire and it's that kind of hospitality that just creates super positive memories of a, of a beautiful country backdrops against stunning stunning mountains and great cycling because the roads all come from all paved. So they're all really well paved, most of them, because the Chinese ship a lot of their goods in, in that direction from over the border. So the Chinese have invested a lot of infrastructure in the roads. So the cycling is super good. So you, you don't feel like you're, you're breaking your bike or breaking your bones. You can actually really enjoy it and look around you and, and just take in all the scenery. At the same time, it's super cheap as well. <laughs> Did you feel pretty safe there? Kyrgyzstan's super safe, yeah. I mean, we stayed with people... Most nights who invited us in and we never felt any degree of trepidation at all in Kyrgyzstan. 
it was yeah you know, it was a lot of drunk people in in Bishkek in the main street but they would normally be very friendly they would be smiling at you they would often invite you in for a sip of whiskey or vodka was the main drink there because it's old USSR but yeah I had no problems at all in fact the whole trip was pretty pretty much problem free but uh, especially Central Asia very very good is Fanola still with you at this point she is yes she rode with me from England to Malaysia so her story is of the first year of the trip and then in Malaysia that's when we broke up and she went home and I carried on on my own how are you guys um carrying on at this point I mean like uh physically and mentally are you, are you still feeling strong or are you having to like take breaks every so often Uzbekistan definitely took a toll on us in terms of our our rationale because we're cycling long distance through the desert we both became quite unwell because of the food there is is obviously not cooked properly and everyone I know has got sick in Uzbekistan so they call it Uzbekistan belly it's quite a common thing that people get and they um get quite sick I remember being in Bukhara one of the big cities in Uzbekistan I was sick for three days yeah it's quite a tough country uh, as well uh, in terms of bureaucracy because you're not allowed to stay in certain hotels there's no all your money has to be changed from money changes. There's no ATMs there. You can't use any US money or, or euros or anything like that. You have to, have to use their money and it's difficult to get. So that did take a toll. But then when we got to Kyrgyzstan, we found because it was tough, it kind of brought us together. And like we got through Uzbek- Uzbekistan and then we got to Kyrgyzstan. We were like ready for the mountains, like ready for, to, for a real cold adventure. And I think that definitely helped us in terms of when it gets tough, you kind of really you get really hard and you get really enjoy it a lot more, I find. What kind of food are you eating, Tim? Are you guys trying to stick to just what you can find in the shops or are you eating in restaurants? Uh, depends. Um, so as I said earlier, we spent sort of like £9,000 on the whole trip. Well, I did anyway. So my, my budget was £9,000. And what we did is in places like Central Asia, you can get a meal for like a pound. So you can go and get a meal. It's not going to break the budget. But at the same time, you've got long distances to cross where there are no restaurants, there are no food services, especially in the deserts of Uzbekistan. So we'd often curry like noodles or bread or or oats, real good kind of cycle camping food. We had a stove with us so we could cook uh, if we needed to. But at the end of a long day, there's nothing better than stopping in a restaurant and having something like lagman, which is like a, a rich noodle soup or a chorba, which is like a soup with just a piece of meat just sitting in the water. Um, that's what made us sick. <laughs> <laughs> but it's real tasty, real tasty food. <laughs> probably very salty, I imagine. Very salty, yeah. <laughs> yeah, which would be probably what you need when it's 40 degrees, I think. Let's say when it's minus 15. Now, this is the section where you also ended up in a Chinese hospital for a few days. What happened? Oh, yeah. So this is so we just finished in China. So our visas were coming to an end and we were maybe four days from China and we wanted to cross into China for it was just before Christmas, just after Christmas. We spent Christmas in Kunming and we're trying to get to Vietnam for New Year's because we want to have like a big party in Vietnam. because It's super cheap. We're going to get really drunk in Vietnam. So three days before we reached the border, we'd camped on the side of a, of a road, almost like a, not a main highway, but quite a busy interior road. And we'd hopped over the barrier and set up camp a little way from the road and the, had a nice sleep. In the morning, we were getting back onto the road. So I lifted Fanola's bike up, I lifted my leg over the barrier, and as I came down, I must have just twisted or sprained my ankle. So I landed on my left ankle and it just twisted as it hit the, hit the road surface. And I dropped the bike. I was rolling on the floor, going, ah, something's wrong. She rushes over. I probably made a bit of a meal of that reaction. But, like, I couldn't cycle. So my leg was sprained. My ankle was sprained, sorry. And I wasn't a- unable to cycle. So we're kind of stuck. We're five kilometers from the nearest town. I tried walking, but it must have got 100 meters down the road before, like, I was like, we've got a hitchhike. We've got a hitchhike. So we put our thumbs out. And luckily, one or two minutes later, this Chinese couple pulled over in there kind of small Fiat 500 type car and their names were Rennie and Rico and they stopped and they spoke English thank God that was fantastic so we could say what happened they lived in the town five kilometers away so they would take us to the hospital and we're like, oh thank you thank you thank you but Rennie Rico sorry the guy then got out of the car Rennie drove me to the hospital but Rico then cycled my my heavy ladle bike all the way five kilometers down the highway to the hospital to um 
to get my bike there as well. And I was super grateful to him, super grateful. And they took us to this hospital. And in the hospital, these we were the, probably the first, very one of the first white people to ever go there. It was a private hospital in China. It was run by a family who ran the hospital and a team of staff of doctors and nurses. And we were shown the best care I've ever received. We were taken for x-ray straight away. I was taken for x-ray straight away. I was then applied Chinese medicine to my ankle. It was wrapped up. I was really well looked after in the hospital. They then had a room upstairs where I stayed for three days. Um, every night we'd go out to a restaurant for dinner. Every morning we'd go to a restaurant for breakfast and even took me on a city tour of their city in their big old four by four where I had my crutches on. It was fantastic. When we left the hospital, they had a party for us to say goodbye and gave us presents. So they gave us some shampoo that looked like um, like a blood bag. It was super cute. And then I was like, oh, thank you very much. This is the best experience I've ever had. I was like, how much do we owe you? And they're like, Tim, just $15 will be fine. Just pay for the x-ray. It was super cute. And it was a much better New Year's actually in the hospital than we were planning to have in Vietnam because the level of friendship we got and the level of care and the level of human kindness was unreal. And it was a fantastic experience. Oh, that's great. And uh, yeah, it's cool, eh? what a great price. Yeah. <laughs> did, <laughs> did you think about or uh, did you have travel insurance? Um, did you plan that before you started out? No, I didn't have any insurance. So this is something I talk about often because I was very lucky that I didn't need insurance. OK, when I started the trip, I got a quote for travel insurance and they wanted two thousand pounds for the year and that's too much like I couldn't afford that I wouldn't be able to go on the trip if I took out the insurance policy so we decided not to not to take out an insurance policy and just go luckily nothing happened to us and we didn't need to get any insurance or get any medical treatment or that our bikes weren't robbed or anything like that that we required it when I was hit by a car in El Salvador I looked up at the doctor who was just about to sew my head back together and I just say I haven't got insurance and he just says to me Tim, don't worry. In El Salvador, we have public health care. And I'm like, yes! But if we'd have hit us, if I'd have got hit in Guatemala or Nicaragua, either of the countries before, little El Salvador, I could have been looking at 50 to 100,000 pound bill because neither of those countries had public health care. So it's super lucky. Let's talk about the next section Darwin mm-hmm. to Auckland. So you must have hopped on a plane then and went down to Darwin. Now you're back in Australia. You've, you said that you had been there before. I had, yes, exactly. So we flew, I flew, so it's me solo at this point. I flew from Singapore to Darwin and I um, then decided to cycle down the middle of Australia through the outback. And the reason for that is is because I'd previously lived in Australia. So I'd actually, in my 2009 to 2011, I lived in Australia. I'd been all around both the East Coast and the West Coast, but I'd never seen the big rock in the middle. I'd never been to Uluru, which is a famous site. It's the biggest rock in Australia. It's a term of aboriginal heritage and culture so i wanted to see that so i thought i'll cycle it so it was about three thousand kilometers together and the three thousand kilometers back to adelaide which is on the south coast so it was a big old beautiful desert ride stunning camping stunning people i really really enjoyed australia more than i thought i would i thought it'd be more difficult but it was super just a real mind cleanser because you just spend your whole time cycling through the desert it's tough but it's it's something about the deserts that really appeals to me. But I think the toughness, when it gets tough, I, I get really happy. I really enjoy it more than when it gets easy. Now, is Australia when you took a work break? Uh, that was in New Zealand. So once I cycled, so I cycled to Uluru, then cycled to Adelaide, and then across the Great Ocean Road to Melbourne, where I stayed with my friend Dylan for a little bit, and then went across to Sydney, where I stayed with my friend Lindsay, before flying to Auckland. Now, in Auckland... I was able to get a job because by this point I'd spent four and a half grand and ran out of money. Right? I'd then, you know, maybe 500 quid left in the bank um, and I needed to complete the same half of the trip. So being 30 at the time, I could get a working holiday visa in New Zealand. So I was able to get a, uh, a visa very easily, just fill out an online form and pay some money. And then I was able to get a job very easily for Flight Centre in Auckland, which is the same company I used to work for in England. They had an office in Auckland. So I basically took a four or five month break out of cycling to live in Auckland and to to save up and continue to work a little bit for the second half of the trip. How much cycling Um, did you get to do in New Zealand? Not as much as I'd liked because I needed to save up some money. So I kind of 
took a real break from the cycling to, to save the money. So I, I only ever really went to the North Island. I didn't go to the South Island. I just explored some of the beaches, Piha around Auckland. I cycled to Wellington, but I didn't see as much of the New Zealand as I'd liked because I was saving money for therefore continue from the second part of the trip, which was all of South America and North America. Um, and it was quite difficult. When I first got to got to a job, when I first took that first week of work, all I wanted to do was run away. I was not ready to work, but um, I knew I needed the money. So I kind of pushed through that first week. And then I was, you know, I was into quite a little group. At the end, I had some really good friends and a really good time. But it was still um, a very different lifestyle to go from cycle, 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 stop almost instantly behind a computer. That was quite a hard transition to make. And that took probably four weeks to kind of adjust. All right, you get on a plane, you go to Santiago, and uh, Santiago. Um, sorry, uh, we didn't. I, I didn't actually go to Santiago. So the original plan, as we go back to to our plans earlier, the original plan was to go to Santiago and then cycle up. But whilst I was in New Zealand, I discovered there was this region in South America called Patagonia that I never even heard of before, and it looked like like Central Asia, like mountains, glaciers, rugged, wild camping, headwinds. And I was like, I really want to go there. And it was at the very bottom tip of South America. So I decided to fly there and then work my way up. And that's probably 3,000 kilometers south of Santiago. Is that Ushuaia? Ushuaia, that's right, yeah. So you could, you fly directly into Ushuaia from New uh, Zealand? Via Buenos Aires. So I had to change in Buenos Aires. Okay. Tell me about that then. You you land in Ushuaia. Your bike is what probably boxed up, and then you gotta yeah, uh, up, yeah. You put it together and get started. What's it like down there in in uh, Ushuaia? Stunning. It is like so. I took one night in a hostel, and I um went and climbed a glacier that was like a thousand meters high, and it was really wild, rugged. And I was on my own, and it was the end of the season. It was cold, and then I got back on the bike the following day, and then cycled to the very bottom of the Carretera. Astral, uh, not Paratra, the Pan American Highway. So it runs from all across North and South America. And the bottom of it is in this national park in Ushuaia. So I started there and then turned around. And what I didn't realize was that the wind always blows from the north to the south. So whilst that first 20 kilometers was really easy, going back for the next month was every day into a headwind, every single day. Like the wind was unreal, blowing me in the face. I'd cycle for eight hours and I'd only be able to travel 40 kilometers just because of the wind was pushing me back. So it was hard. And often I'd have to sleep like underneath the road, like I'd crawl into a storm drain because the wind was so tough that my tent was just flying all over the place. I couldn't get any sleep. So I'd crawl into these little storm drains underneath the road to get a night, quiet night's sleep and crawl out again like a little troll and get back on the bike <laughs> and continue going against the, uh, going against the wind. It was tough. <laughs> 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 oh man, a, like a little troll. <laughs> a little <laughs> troll, yeah. <laughs> okay, so like, how long did that last? This the the uh, the issue with the wind. Uh, a month, so a month of tough, tough, like screaming at the wind, cycling, and then you cross into Chile, and you go into the Carretera Astral, and then the wind stops because that's where the um, a mountain ridge, the start of the Andes, lies. So the minute you get into Chile, the wind stops, and you're you're good again. But that first month is tough, unless you're going from the north to the south and you're flying, because <laughs> it always goes the same way. What's the distance on that Carretera Astral? You, I got it here in my notes that you, um, well, I, yeah, actually on my notes here, you said that, um, paraphrasing here, it's stunning, but it's just not the adventure you were hoping for. Yeah, that's a good um, a good point to, to make about the Carretera Astral. It's stunning, right? It's this unpaved rocky road that runs for about a thousand kilometers in, in Chile and Patagonia. Um, you've got waterfalls, you've got lakes, you've got fresh water everywhere. You've got these big ferns and these big water lilies that come off the side of the road. So it's pretty, but like where I was been used to kind of like the climates of central Asia, Australia, uh, that's where I find myself really enjoying the trip a lot more. Carretera Astral, I was passing maybe 10 cyclists every day. So normally when you're in somewhere like remote, you see someone, you stop and you talk for hours and you share tips and you're going, oh, what is this like? Oh, do you want to come with me? Let's go and make a camp. And sh here it's just more like a cycling holiday destination. And you're just kind of waving at people. And, you know, there's a network of people staying in the same places all the time. The views are stunning, but I just felt it wasn't remote. It wasn't as wild as I would have hoped. And that's kind of why, for me, as someone who's doing a big journey and I've seen a lot of really interesting and 
conditions and hardships and mountains. I just found it wasn't the kind of adventure that I was hoping for. What's after Chile? Is that Bolivia? Yeah, so I went through Chile and then into Bolivia. Yeah, Bolivia was wicked. I have in my notes here this Salar de Uyuni. Don't know if Uyuni, I'm saying yeah. that right, but uh, that's right, yeah. the largest salt flat on Earth. So it, it was is, that in Bolivia? It's in Bolivia, yeah. So as you so as, so as you go from the south of Bolivia towards the capital, La Paz, you have this salt flat called the Salar de Uyuni. And it is the world's largest salt flat. It is a hexagonal salt crystal. So it's a form of lake, but it's dried up. And the, so the, the bed is super flat and it's super white. So in every direction you can see for maybe 100 kilometers. But you have this white floor that makes it super light, like a different experience than anything else I've cycled on. And the salt is almost three-dimensional in its hexagonal formations. So you ride with like a crunch, crunch, crunch. And it gives you this really unearthly feel to your ride it's stunningly beautiful and there's no one around so one of the things that all the cyclists do me included is to cycle a little bit of it naked <laughs> so you stop because you know no one's going to run there's no tour buses it's not like the uh Carretera astral where you wouldn't do it so you take your clothes off and you ride for a bit naked it's a really fun experience <laughs> <laughs> so you said bolivia is pretty wicked um, tell me about bolivia okay so bolivia is like super fun again like all my three countries that I list as highlights, like Kyrgyzstan and Georgia, Bolivia fits the same bracket. It's remote. It's wild. It's got beautiful mountains, 4,000, 5,000 meter peaks of the Andes. The food is interesting. The people are warm and friendly. You've got llamas and alpacas just popping their head up when you're having a camp and they'll just, you wake up and see like an alpaca looking at you with a bow tie on. You're like, what is going on? <laughs> And you've got these architectural cities like Sucre, which is probably my favorite city in the whole of South America. It's like Spanish colonial architecture with a consistent 25 degree heat all day long, every day, because of the altitude keep and where it is in the latitude. It keeps it at that kind of temperature all the time. And it's super cheap. You can have a two course meal for a dollar, like a soup and a chicken and rice for a dollar. And it's fantastic. Wow. Did you get sick in Bolivia? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I got really sick in Bolivia. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe but the sickest I got was in Bolivia because I drank this water from an abandoned mine. So I was staying in this, I was cycling down towards the cellar. So I hadn't reached the cellar yet and I found an abandoned salt mine. I thought, oh, this will make a good place to camp. So I cycled up into the mine and I found the office had the door blown open. So I walked into the office and I found all this paperwork from like 2009. I'm like, all right, well, what I'll do then, I'll stay in here because I don't think anyone's coming because it's been like 10 years since anyone was last here. So I bed down for the night, have a really nice sleep out the wind. Next morning, I get up, I brush my teeth, and I think, oh, you know what? I'm a little thirsty because there was running water to this to this office, so I don't know where the water was coming from, but there was running water in the sink. So I was brushing my teeth, then I decided to drink some of it inadvertently, <laughs> and now this water had been probably sitting in this pipe for ten years, <laughs> and then maybe three or four hours later, I can feel my stomach churning up like really badly, and I was like, oh, something's wrong, something's wrong, and I. I just pulled over, set a tent up by this water hole that I found. So I had access to water and I had the worst diarrhea. I was puking, had diarrhea for three days. And I, every time I burped, it felt like rotten eggs um, in my tent. I was in a really, really bad way. But I was in the middle of nowhere. There was no one else around. So I was sitting there going, am I going to die or, is, or am I going to wake up? <laughs> but luckily I um, I got through it other than the, the state of outside of the tent. It was probably worse. And then after three days, I continued and started to get better and then when I cycled through the Sala, I went to the town of um, Potosi, which is the next one across. And I met some other cycle tourists and they told me I had what was called Guardia fever. And you can tell because you have yellow poo and you, you burp smell of eggs. I was like, oh, that was a real lucky escape then because it can be really bad and it can last for weeks if you don't get antibiotics. But I managed to cure it. Touch wood. I didn't drink a lot of that water, but I managed to cure it pretty quickly. Man, everybody seems to get sick in Bolivia one way or yeah, another. Yeah, yeah it's true, right? <laughs> So after Bolivia, what's next? Well, how did you find the rest of South America? I loved it. Oh, I absolutely loved it. The South America is super fun. So from Bolivia, you go to Peru, which is like Peru has three regions. So you've got the beach region, which is cool if you like beaches, but that's not really my thing. But then you've got the mountains and you've got some wild jungle, some proper Amazonian jungle. So I'd continually go up the mountains and then get bored of the mountains and then go to the jungle for a little bit and cycle in the jungle and then cycle back up the 4,000 meters to the mountains and do the mountains a bit. And then, oh, you know what? I miss the jungle a bit. So go back down, 
go back to the jungle and you've got all this variation of landscape and people and food so you never get bored in Peru like there's always something new to see because if you get if you don't if you get sick of like mountain food and mountain weather you can literally just turn right and go to the jungle and have some plantain and some fried fish so um it's a really really fun country Peru I've got a lot of love for it what's after Peru Um, uh, after Peru I went to Ecuador which is really steep so whereas Peru has like 5,000 meter passes but it's like five or six or seven percent gradient you get to ecuador and it's only half the size like two and a half thousand meter passes but it's like 15 percent gradient and it is tough but it's fun it's very lots going on good food good jungle really fun country i got sick in ecuador as well but i think that's just part of the food but that's common and then from ecuador you can go to colombia and colombia is super fun super super fun i really enjoy colombia a lot uh, what happens when you – so for, from Colombia, you make your way into Panama? Yeah, that's right. So I had to get um, – so there's a couple of ways to get from Panama to Colombia. Basically, because there is a piece of jungle there called the Darien Gap where essentially people who are running drugs between Central and South America and there's a lot of um, rebel uprising against the government in that jungle, it's very unsafe for people to – travel so there's no roads either so you, it's kind of there's only a walking path but i would it would take a braver man than me to go through that bit of jungle so there are a few ways to get around so you can fly which is quite expensive and quite boring you can get a sailboat which is quite expensive and quite fun or you can get a series of little speed boats which is super cheap but really not that fun because you're just bouncing off these of these waves like these, these speed boats are going really fast and you literally catapulted from your seat out of out of the seat, and your head hits the top of the boat, and then you land back on a on a wooden seat again. It's really really choppy and kind of makes you feel quite sick. But it's only a hundred bucks to get from Colombia to Panama, whereas in the sailboat is maybe five hundred bucks. So it's a lot cheaper way to go. How long does that uh, speedboat journey take? So you get one speedboat from a place called Turbo to a place called Capulgana, which is like the end of Colombia, and that takes maybe two hours. Then you get another one from Capulgana to Carti, which only takes 45 minutes. And then you get a final speedboat from Puerto Abodia to Carti, and that takes five hours. But for us, as we were, we'd been on the row, been on the sea for three and a half hours, really looking forward to getting off the boat, the engine breaks. And we're like, me, there was two other guys from America, there was a guy from France, all trying to travel across to Panama, and the engine breaks. And the, the captain's like, I'm sorry, the engine's break, we're going to have to stop. So we pull up to this abandoned island. Like it's, literally, it was just sand and palm trees. And he's like, we're going to have to stay here the night. And we thought we were getting done. We are getting robbed. We might like get taken advantage of. But what happened is realistically, the engine did break. And um, he he came back the next day and picked us up and took us all the way to Carty. But it was a bit of a daring, daring experience. Just because what we'd read that people were taking advantage of tourists. But really, his engine did break. And we, the next day we got a new boat and we went all the way to Carty. So we actually got a free night on an abandoned island, which was really cool. El Salvador, that's where you got hit by the car, as you were saying. Um, what happened and, I mean, how bad were you hurt? Uh, pretty bad. So what happened was I just, I was, uh, just been in El Salvador for like two days and I was having a, a really good time. I was really enjoying it. I've just been from Honduras and I enjoyed that and I was kind of getting into my into my sway in, in sort of Central America into these countries that I had were previously dangerous, but just finding love everywhere. And I just had a banana sandwich. It was about midday. And I just got back on the bike and I was cycling along the road, heading to a place called San Miguel. And I, all I wanted to do there was go to San Miguel and drink a beer called San Miguel. And that was my aim. But what happened was, as I was going, all I heard, the last thing I remember hearing was a screech of some brakes really hard behind me, looking around and seeing a blue pickup truck. And that's the last thing I remember until I was woke up on the pavement. I looked up and I saw a policeman and I saw a woman. And I all I said to them, the first thing I said was hospital. And then he took me straight in the back of the police car and drove me straight to hospital where I'd had a concussion. My head was smashed open. So I was bleeding out. You could see my skull through my head. Um, luckily, my skull wasn't damaged. I had quite a thick skull. Luckily. So, so what happened was they sewed me up. But they had to keep me in for 10 days for brain damage. I couldn't walk for five days because of swelling in my knees. Um, I had scars across my hands where I'd landed. Um, So I was pretty banged up. But luckily, 
I was okay. Do you know what I mean? Like no bones were broken. No thing. My ankles were sprained, but that wasn't a problem that could heal. My head was stitched up and I had no brain damage, which was the main thing. Like I was really, really lucky. And like an idiot, I wasn't wearing my helmet at the time. I had a helmet, but I clipped it to the back of the bicycle with an intention to wear it somewhere else. And so from that point, I always wear a helmet now. Yeah, it's really, really, really badly injured. I was in hospital for 10 days. I then came out of hospital and then I still couldn't cycle mentally and physically. And then went into, I checked into a hotel for $7 a night and spent another 10 days in the hotel recuperating. Um, where some other cyclists came and stayed with me for a few days as well. Kenneth and Marie, they were really nice because they were in El Salvador and I'd met them previously and they'd come to stay with me in El Salvador to make sure I was okay for a few days. That was super cute of them. And they're really good friends of mine now still. But yeah, it took me 20 days to recover from being from the moment of being hit. So it was pretty serious. So do you have any memories at all of what happened? I'm wondering if you like, you must have got your, your bike and your legs just kicked out from under you and you and you must have flew over the top of this car and all yeah. that and just landed just get smashed into the pavement again i'm guessing yeah i guess that's exactly what all i can think of because i'm pretty sure from where where i saw the marks on the bike and on the luggage he'd hit me from um from behind on the sort of right hand side my right hand side so um i can only imagine i flew up but i have no memory at all i've got zero memory i wish i knew because i'd love to see if i did a backflip or whatever but there was no CCTV and <laughs> no GoPro. No GoPro. No, exactly. That would have been a lot of <laughs> I'd love to see that. But um, when I then, I felt really bad in hospital. I didn't see the police then for five days. And then the police came to see me after five days. And I felt, spent five days of feeling bad for this guy. Like I was like, oh man, it hit me. Like, oh, this is Carla right. And the police told me it was a hit and run. And I was like, oh, up yours, man. <laughs> At this point, you still have no travel insurance? Still have no travel insurance. Yeah, that's what I said when I spoke to the guy when he when he said um, I'm going to sew you up and I asked for travel insurance and he goes, "Don't worry, man. In El Salvador, we have public health care." So it cost um, you? Was there any cost to you at all? Zero, none. Wow. Yeah, not not a single penny. Um, and it was really kind because the embassy and the police then found all my stuff. They went all through the bushes. Must have picked up everything that I owned found my passport, handed my passport details to the embassy. The embassy was then able to find my parents and let them know what happened. My parents were able to then call me at the hospital so I could talk to them, and they were very worried, obviously. And there was a period of when I felt like I was going to go home, and I was like, man, I'm going to let this beat me. And then I kind of thought, you know what? I'm not going to let this beat me. I'm going to continue. I was like 4,000 miles at this point away from the end of the trip, and I was like, I'm not going to finish. I am going to finish, sorry. And I'm going to carry on with the rest of the trip. And that was a really strong moment in the whole trip, I would say. How was Mexico? Mexico was cool, man. I enjoyed, enjoyed Mexico. Beautiful food. Beautiful food. Beautiful people. In Colombia, it was maybe December. And I had spoken to my friend Sandeep, who had told me that he was getting married in April. So when he told me he was getting married, he kind of put a deadline on the trip because I wanted to get home to see his getting married. So whereas most people take a route from Mexico over to the Baja uh, Peninsula, I went on the east coast around the Gulf of Mexico in that way, which is quite slightly flatter, but slightly quicker. So it got me into Texas going north in that direction. And I found that the Mexican people were lovely and no issues, like good place to stay, cheap, beautiful food, lovely women, really good place to go. Tim, I skipped over Nicaragua because we had that as one of your least favorite places. So let's rewind and tell me about what was the deal with Nicaragua. Yeah, I just think it was just really, really busy. So I just couldn't really find any good world camping. Now, some people really like Nicaragua. and But for me, I just found it was a little bit too touristy. It was a little bit too... It's quite boring. There's only a few main highways as well that I was on. So I was kind of like on these main highways just being shuttled through. A bit like Hungary, where I found it was almost like a passing place between one place and the other. Um, Nicaragua, for me, felt like the entryway into the more interesting Central American countries like El Salvador, Honduras and um, Guatemala, which I found much more fun and exciting. So there's nothing particularly wrong with Nicaragua, but it was just for me, it was just a place that wasn't as exciting and fun as a lot of other places I've been to. So now you're in Texas heading mm -hmm. east and then you're going to head up the east coast to Reading, pennsylvania so tell me about your time in the u.s uh so this is really funny right so the first night i'm in texas i'm staying with this chap in a warm showers house and warm showers is like couch surfing for cyclists it was really great to be in america because i was able to speak 
uh, in English again. I've been speaking in really bad Spanish for about a year. So it just felt really comfortable, really nice to be able to speak English. And I went into this guy's house and he was looking after me. He let me camp on his porch and we had dinner. And he's like, hey, Tim, do you want to do your washing? I was like, yeah, cool, man. Yeah, thank you very much. So I went to put a washing into the washing machine. And on top of his washing machine was a pistol. And I was like, bro, is that, is that a pistol there? And he's like, yeah, 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 this is Texas. I'm allowed it. I was like, wow. That was a bit of a cultural shock for me. Because you think just because it's English speaking, it's still a long way from Europe in that respect. Yes, that is for <laughs> sure. Did you have like a favorite part of the U.S.? So I cycled from a little along the south. So I cycled along um, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida, all that kind of long. They call it the southern tier. So along that south bit because it was kind of February, March, April. So it was nice and nice and warm down the south. And it was also culturally really interesting. Uh, Louisiana, I loved, man. I loved Louisiana. I loved New Orleans and Baton Rouge. Fabulous places, full of great food and great people. Could definitely take another holiday to New Orleans anytime you, you want to take me there. It's fantastic. So, yeah, the South, I really enjoyed it. I really thought Texas was good, but the South in general was just fantastic in terms of Southern hospitality, interesting food, and interesting people. It was super safe. I never had any trouble. Um, the only time I got any trouble in America is when I stepped on a bullet ant in Texas and I had a searing pain at my leg for 12 hours, but that was, that was my own fault. <laughs> you stepped, I, I didn't understand you. You stepped on a what? A bullet ant. Um, they have these ants in Texas that are like, they call it the most dangerous bite in the world because it stings for like 12 hours. So I camped in Texas, wild camped in this field and it was about seven o'clock in the morning and I went out to take a pee and then I stepped on this ant without realizing and I felt this pain go up my foot. I wasn't wearing any shoes like an idiot. And I just saw this big ant with his pincers up looking at me. And I was like, oh, mate, you've got me. And then the pain lasted for like 12 hours. It was really painful. <laughs> <laughs> man, I don't think I've even ever heard of a bullet ant before. No, watch out, man. They're down south. They're dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, uh, you, you're heading up the east coast of the U.S., Mm -hmm. um, I guess you're cycling on roads, probably some side roads or whatnot. Yeah. And um, then you make it in finally into Reading, Pennsylvania. I got to say, when I went to your website, first of all, I'm like, w it says Reading, Pennsylvania, but he looks like he's in Japan. I was like, what's yeah, going yeah, on? Yeah. yeah. So they had, so what happened was I was trying to pick a place that would be a nice place to end the trip. Right. And Reading, Pennsylvania, doesn't really have like a town centre. It doesn't really have like a, a big sort of welcome to Reading. Because quite actually, it's quite a small place, really. It's not where well, most people would never finish their bike trip from Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, but they had this pagoda. So they had this like little mountain, like 200 metre high mountain. And on top of it, it had a Japanese pagoda. And it says, town of Reading, Pennsylvania. And I was like, ah, oh, well, that's the perfect place to end because it's got a nice sign. It's got a picture. It's a bit of a mountain, so I can finish it going uphill, which is kind of the whole point of the trip. It's sort of challenging myself and yeah so this weird japanese pagoda on a hill in Reading, pennsylvania was at the official end of the trip <laughs> and your parents were waiting there for you yeah that was a real surprise so a few days before i was camping out in like, lancaster pennsylvania and i got a message from my dad saying tim like when are you going to finish your trip and i was like oh probably like you know midday tomorrow and he goes where are you going to end it i was like oh probably the town center and he's like no tim where are you going to end it i was like oh he wants to know where I'm going to end it. Why would he want to know that? So that's when he found the, the pagoda and said, Dad, I'll be at the pagoda around like 11, 30, 12. And I actually didn't arrive until 1. So he was getting a bit worried. But I didn't know that they'd flown out. So it was a bit of a surprise because I I didn't know they were coming. It was like a surprise thing that they'd organised. They'd organised some press and some um, photographers at the top. They'd got they'd hang out a, a British flag and an American flag to say welcome and congratulations to the end of the trip. So when I was going up this mountain, I was thinking, I wonder if they're here. So they wouldn't be here. I'd be quite upset. And I was like, oh, no. But I turned the corner and there were mum and dad standing under the, the flags. And it was such a happy moment to have finally done it. And they just screamed, like, you did it. You did it. And I was like, yeah, I did it. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah a really nice moment. Yeah, a great moment. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it was fantastic. And then we went for dinner afterwards and we sat in a, in a pub and we were just having a a Philly cheesesteak, in fact, and they were like, so Tim, like, we're going to now go to, to Pennsylvania and then to no, Philadelphia and then to New York. What do you want to do? And I was like, I'm done with cycling. <laughs> let's just let's just get the bus and let's go and uh, have a holiday for a week before we go home. It was nice. When you look back on it, is there any, like, one or two memories that stand out as being the best memories? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a, a, 
a large majority of memories that are the best. But trying to pick one or two out is obviously going to be tough. The, the experience I spoke about earlier in China in that hospital was the fab, most fabulous New Year I've ever had. These People were just super kind and took us in at their at their hospital and wanted nothing in return but just to see me and Fanola just have a lovely time. And it was super heartwarming. And that message resonates across the world. That's just one small three-day story of what has been an adventure of humanity and of hospitality. Every day, it's just, you're meeting people who have very little who just want to share, even though you don't have a language or a culture in common. It doesn't matter. They're going to invite them to the house just for a cup of tea and a, a laugh about the funny hats that we have or something like that. So it's a really good memory. And the trip is more about the hospitality and the, the journey than anything else. Another really good memory is just the mountains and the scenery, and the nature. So one of this really compounded me is there was a glacier in Argentina called Pareto Moreno. And it was $15 to get into this glacier. And I was like, oh, man, I don't want to go pay for nature. I felt really bad. But I kind of saw a picture and it was one of these pictures you see and you think that can't be real. Like That cannot be in this planet. So I cycled all the way to this glacier and then I stood there on my own. There's a few people around, but it was mainly just me. And I just watched these shards of massive shards of ice the size of four by four cars cascade off the glacier into the bright blue waters below. And I was just awe, like gobsmacked at how beautiful this planet really is. And that memory, every time I think of like a really amazing point and a really amazing memory, you're just standing there like, on a bicycle and self-propelled travel, no emissions and just realising how fantastic this country is, this world is, and how we need to keep, you know, look after it. What about the adventure are you most proud of? I'm proud that I did it, man. I'm proud that, um, you know, it changed me as a person as well. So, A, I'm proud that I did it. I set out to do something that was well out of my comfort zone. I, I didn't cycle before, really. I wasn't a cyclist. I wasn't anyone who was a sportsman. I was in the lowest group of PE. I was a bit of a chubby chap when I left. I was 15 stone. But I took it on and it changed me physically. It proved to me that I can do anything and also changed my whole outlook on the world. I wanted to see if the world was a really good place. And then when I got to the end of it, I can tell the world is a really good place. And it was fantastic. And that was from that stubborn nature of actually completing the trip and seeing everything on the bicycle. That's what made me really proud. Did you lose a lot of weight through the trip? Yeah, no, yeah. So I easily would have lost maybe three and a half stone. So what's that? That's I don't know. 42 plus. That's that's nearly 50 pounds, I think. 50 pounds. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a lot of weight. But I did cycle almost every day. And then I ate a lot of banana sandwiches. <laughs> so that would help. So if anyone wants to go on a weight loss program, I'd recommend cycling around the world. <laughs> Um, you at one time, you of course were the up and coming, uh, green sort of never before cycled person who, mm -hmm. who was looking to, uh, Alistair Humphreys for inspiration. And now maybe someone's looking towards you for inspiration. What do you, what do you say to people? What advice do you give them? So I just did a talk at the cycle touring festival about this is that point really. And it's just about, there are so many reasons not to start. Right. You don't have to complete anything, but if you don't start, you'll never know. So there are lots of people now who are taking cycle touring is exploding on a rapid scale. That I think three or four years ago, it wasn't that big. And I think now maybe I just see more of it. But now it seems to be a lot more accepted. A lot more youngsters are going on big adventures on the bicycle as opposed to going in the buses and the trains and the cars and things. So it's just making those plans, making yourself accountable to those plans and actually going because if you, if you never go, you'll never learn. But if you, at least you go for one day and realize you don't like it, you still learn something. You still learn you don't like this. And if you never go, you'll never understand that. So the biggest advice I can go is make the plans. Tell your boss. Tell your friends. Tell your family. And then on that day when you leave, give it your all and go. And then if you enjoy it, do that again the next day and the next day and the next day. And you never know after three years, you just cycle all around the world and you can change your life. How was the Cycle Touring Festival? Yeah, it was really good. It was like so warm and lovely with such great people. So I'd never been before. Um, I was meant to do a talk there last year, but I literally just got back and was in a really like confused headspace about changing my whole life and being back. And I hadn't seen some people for three years. So there was lots of parties and things like that. So I didn't go. So I went this year and I did a talk and it was really well received. The people were really kind. I had a great time. And it's one of the only places where you can go like, yeah, I'm going to go cycle around Africa. And everyone goes, yeah, cool, man. Like, if you say that to your friends down a the pub, they think you're crazy. But these people got it and they get the whole concept of cycle touring. 
So it's a really good like-minded festival. Uh, it takes place in Clivero every year. It's run by Tim and Laura Moss. So I recommend anyone who's into cycle touring, just get a ticket next year. It's fantastic. What would you estimate the crowd size to be this year? Uh, maybe two to 300 in total. Well, that's pretty good. Is it? And it's over a weekend? Yeah, it takes place in the Bank Holiday weekend. So it was... Um, so they had like free campsites and they've got uh, a large hall there, Wado Hall, and they've got a marquee. So there's like a series of talks and workshops going on throughout the two days. And yeah, everyone there is just full of light. So it's just anyone you talk to has just got a really interesting story and perspective on cycling in the world. So it's a really good place to be. Did you happen to run into any Americans there? Yes, there were. Yeah, there was a couple who were doing a talk. I can't remember her name. That's Amer- Megan. Megan was there. She was doing a talk with her husband. They were from... They'd cycle the rag bride. Do you know the rag bride? I think it's oh, Iowa. Yeah, through it? Iowa. Yeah. Yeah, they'd cycle that. They did a talk on the rag bride. It's really interesting. It sounded like a really fun American um, cycle trip. Yeah. Tim, your trip ended about a, a year ago. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, nearly. Yeah, nearly. Just over a year ago. And how was that transition back into the everyday life? At the beginning, it was still felt like I was on a trip because I hadn't seen people for like three years. So there was so much catching up to do. It felt like I was still having all these new experiences and all these new stories. And it was super fun just going to the pub and speaking and telling people what I'm up to. And it was great. And then after a couple of months, it kind of dawned on me that this was now my, my God, that was over. That was, that was done. And I was back to normal life. But what I did to help that was I now work as a bushcraft instructor. So I teach kids on their residential trips over the summer, how to go camping, fire lighting. We got some fish, we play games in the woods. So I now live and work in the woods for a company called the Bushcraft Company. And we um, just inspire the next generation of kids in their in their outdoor life, which is super important these days, is that all the kids you know, look to their iPhones for their source of entertainment rather than being outside. So we give them this over a course of three to five days. And I really, really enjoy sharing those skills with the children. And the good thing about that is that job only lasts for four months a year. So I've got time to actually plan new and forthcoming adventures in my time off. I went to Qatar for three months to to teach bike rides out there. And then I, I've written a book. So I've just written a book of this of this trip, which is hopefully coming out in September. That was a big adventure. And now I'm working again for the Bushcraft Company um, until September. And then I will try and get the book out and maybe do some more cycling or pack rafting or something really fun and cool. So it changed my life, essentially. So I don't really have a normal life yet, but I have a happier life, which is what I'm after. Yeah, of course. Well, yeah, Bushcraft Company, that sounds very interesting. Better than sitting uh, staring in an office staring at a screen, I guess. Massively, massively, yeah. It's super fun. So are you self-publishing the book? I don't know yet. So I've written it and then won a competition to get it edited for free. There was an American lady and she picked up, she ran a competition on Twitter that I entered and she selected my synopsis to be the one that she would edit for free. And it's a two and a half thousand pound package that she's doing for me. So she's got it now. So rather than writing it and then going to publishers, I'm now in a position to go to publishers with a book that's actually been for a pretty decent edits process. So I'm going to then, once I get it back from her, which should be in about 30 days or so, I'm then going to go and see if any publishers want to do it. If they don't, I'll sell publish. But if they do, I'll go that route. Or I've got options to do. But I think I'm in a strong position. I have a book that's actually been edited um, very goodly, very well. Good yeah. thing that's bad offering. But yeah, very, it's been, <laughs> <laughs> very goodly. But yeah, it's, uh, it's gone for a really good edit process. No, that's say. that's awesome. I mean, you scored with that that because that's a huge. Yeah, yeah you got to have a good editor. Massively, yeah. Like I'm. You know, I'm, I enjoyed writing it. It was very cathartic to write the book. It was a really good experience and it let me down. I'm trying to be really honest in it, talking about all my real thoughts and feelings as opposed to being a travelogue of I went here and here and here. And that kind of honesty makes it a, quite a harder process to write. But I think it's, I, fingers crossed, it's, it's okay. Yeah, well, hopefully you've infused some of your humor in it too. Um, I've been sitting over here biting my tongue the whole time because you're, you're funny. <laughs> you're super funny and I'm trying not to laugh into the microphone. Oh, thank you. It's nice to hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Tim, if people want to get in touch with you, if they want to learn more about um, the trip and and possibly the upcoming book, how do they find you online? I guess I've, I've kind of built a pretty basic website. It's timmillikin.com, T-I-M-M-I-L-L-I-K-I-N.com. Um, and you can find like an email contact there. And feel free to email me if you want to have a chat about anything. I always just love chatting to people and sharing thoughts and ideas so you can email me there or you can go on instagram which is what the people do now and that's at tim c millikin on instagram and that is um 
a new thing I've set up, but apparently it's what everybody does. So I'm doing Instagram now. Okay. Tim Milliken, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing the story of your three years of cycling adventure, <laughs> uh, basically around the world. Uh, appreciate it. And congratulations again on the accomplishment. Thank you, Paul. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening. You can find this episode online at the pursuitzone.com slash TPZ172. Be sure to head over to the pursuitzone.com for the link to subscribe to the show and like the show on Facebook or follow along on Twitter at the pursuit zone. To send feedback, you can write me at paul at the pursuitzone.com or you can leave me a voice message at speakpipe.com slash the pursuit zone. This episode was recorded on June 2nd, 2019. For the show notes and more great adventure travel podcasts, visit thepursuitzone.com. Thank you.